What's going on, Salt Strong Nation? Me and Tony are back with some really in-depth tactics on redfish. Today, we're going to be talking about redfish feeding patterns, some of the different lures we're using, what's working right now. We're going to go over a lot of different tactics. Uh, we've got Tony here with me. Tony, what have you been seeing out on the water recently as far as uh, some redfish patterns and their feedings, the lures you're using, and uh, the areas that you're catching fish? So with redfish, you know, we're in the springtime right now. So we'll be talking about, you know, springtime redfish feeding behaviors. It's really very similar, you know, from season to season. I'm always finding redfish up shallow, but the time of year and time of day is going to determine, you know, like when they're going to push up shallow. And I'm still seeing them pushing up shallow a little later in the morning, you know, not really first thing in the morning. They're still pushed off a little bit uh, toward the edges of the flats and, you know, outside of the creek mouths and then once that water comes up sun comes up they tend to get a little bit more aggressive and you know the shallows are really where you're going to find the redfish and that really comes down to their their feeding behavior what they're eating their their bottom feeders their scavengers they're not so much of an ambush predator like say snook or trout who will just sit and like right off a point and then dart out and go get whatever prey comes by redfish they're looking for you know snails clams crabs stuff on the bottom that's why you find tailing redfish because they're eating off the bottom you don't find you know tailing snook or <laughs> tailing trout so just understanding their feeding behavior can definitely help you dial in where you're going to find those redfish yeah absolutely and i know we're going to talk about some of the different you know scenarios the lures we're going to use but i, I agree I, I feel like most of my red fishing is done pretty shallow i would say that uh you know as we're kind of transitioning out of winter time you're still finding a lot of fish that are hanging close to those deeper areas. They're kind of starting to move out of the deeper zones. They are pushing shallow a little bit later on still, but I am starting to catch them on top water, which is definitely a warm water trend. Uh, that's, that's just one of those things that kind of indicates to me redfish are moving into some of that warm water behavior. And I'm definitely starting to kind of catch them in the middle of the day in just a couple inches of water. So they're definitely moving into those kind of springtime patterns. And eventually they'll be in those summer patterns where you can kind of catch them till around 11 o'clock on top water. So it's going to be a really fun season we've got ahead of us, um, but kind of starting to touch on some of the lures that we're using. Like I said, I've been using a lot of top water. Have you been getting a good top water bite in your area recently, Tony? Top water, not so much yet. Again, going back to feeding behavior, when the redfish start getting really aggressive, that's when I feel they'll start hitting top waters more because they don't have mal like snook or trout do, you know? Their bottom jaw is shorter than their top and the top of their jaw and trout and snook, you know, their bottom jaw is like under slung. So they can come up from the bottom and feed on the surface. Redfish, they primarily feed on the bottom. So whenever you see a redfish come up for a top water, you'll see their back come out of the water because they got, they have to get high up in the water to go after that top water. So if you're catching redfish on top water, they're being very aggressive. It, it's a great time to go after them. I, I haven't seen it yet here. Uh, but should be happening soon. Yeah. And, and when I'm not throwing my top water, I'm using those same exact presentations that you mentioned, kind of sticking a little bit close to the bottom, low and slow. That was really my strategy throughout the winter. It was kind of plucking along the bottom with some shrimp presentations, maybe slow rolling a paddle tail. Um, but, you know, I, I completely agree with you. The way that their mouth is positioned, it's really disadvantageous for top water. I've had a lot of missed strikes recently. And, you know, whenever I've used top water throughout the years, uh, that's, that's kind of something that I've seen. Most of the redfish that come up for those strikes don't hit it on the first time. You have to continue to work that top water to get that bite just because, like you said, their mouth isn't designed for it. There are some top waters that their tail hangs lower. Uh, and, you know, you might have a little bit more of an increased hookup ratio. But as you said, I agree. It's not necessarily the best lure to be using for them, even right now. But it does indicate to me, again, they are moving into some warmer water patterns, which means we can start fishing a little bit faster. We can kind of upsize maybe our bait profile because there are some more bait fish moving in. Uh, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that as well. I know you said that you've been using a lot of subsurface stuff just because those fish really aren't really hitting top water just yet in your, your area. Are you kind of moving more towards bait fish presentation? Are you still sticking with shrimp or are you kind of hanging in the middle with that jerk shad? I know the gulp jerk shad is one of your kind of go-to lures that we've seen used throughout the years, but what's your bait presentation kind of profile size and the uh, retrieves looking like right now for these reds? So typically I'm doing like a twitch, twitch, pause, retrieve, anything from like a soft plastic jerk shad, like the Alabama leprechaun or gulp jerk shad to a shrimp imitation you know you basically work those two lures very similar 
you know, twitch, twitch, bounce, bounce, let it sit for a few seconds and repeat that. If I find that redfish are being pretty aggressive or, you know, I'm trying to find fish, I'll switch to a paddle tail because you can cover more water quickly with the paddle tail. You know, you just cast it out, slow roll it right along the bottom or, you know, subsurface right in the middle of that water column. And if they're being aggressive, they'll go after it. Uh, primarily, you know, middle, mid morning to late morning is when I'm switching to a paddle tail, just so I can search for those fish early morning. Those fish seem a little bit more sluggish and, you know, that slower presentation seems to work better. Yeah. So in the areas that you're using these baits, is this, you know, I know you said you're kind of sticking to the shallows. Is there grass present? Are you having to use the, the weedless hooks or are you just kind of bouncing along with jig heads, maybe near some structure? What, what are the kind of areas that you're using these baits? In? So unfortunately there's no grass where I'm at. There used to be a lot of grass, but the fish are still in those same areas where there used to be grass. So if you're in a situation like that, sort of go back to those same spots where you used to find fish back in the day when there, there were uh, good areas of seagrass. And this year in particular, or this time of year, you know, spring, I've been seeing a lot more fish, you know, in the coves. You know, let's say you have a shoreline, then you have a little pocket in that shoreline. That little pocket usually has softer, muddy bottom because you don't have a lot of current going through there. And that's where a lot of crabs hang out, shrimp, uh, clams, all those things that those redfish like to eat on the bottom. So I've been finding fish in, you know, muddy coves like that. And also, you know, if you have an island, let's say you have a deeper cut on one side of an island, then on the other side, you have a long stretch of shallow water. I've actually been finding more fish this time of year, you know, when you have those cold fronts that still come in later in the year on the side where you have a deeper drop off coming up to a shallow shoreline, just because those fish can quickly go from shallow to deep if they need to, if a front happens to come through. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's exactly where I've been finding fish is they, they've been kind of close to those shallow coves, but those areas leading up to it, you know, I've been fishing a mix of marsh kind of over in these Galveston areas. I've been kind of checking out some other areas here in Corpus that have marsh. And it just seems like all those little islands and coves are where the fish are right now. And as you said, the deeper channels kind of where those fish can have choices and options depending on what fronts are coming through uh fishing those kind of deeper zones that are close to the shallow zones uh, where they could move into have a little bit easier prime feeding opportunities for the crustaceans where you're going to see them tailing maybe there are going to be some bait fish that are going to get blown in there with the wind uh, it just kind of depends and, and those fish having that type of zone that's got you know the deep channel close to points close to really good shallow feeding structure the more options those fish have i, I seem to find that those areas are going to be more productive uh, for reds. Now, like I was asking you, you know, the areas that you're using a lot of this tackle. And the reason I asked that question is I'm seeing my presentations change kind of later on in the day. So I, like I said, I've been using a lot of top water. Reason for that is I've been fishing around a lot of oyster bars and a lot of shell, which is a really great area to be focused on in the springtime because oyster bars attract a lot of attention from bait. There's a lot of microorganisms that small shrimp and small bait fish are going to feed on. So that kind of draws a lot of the bait into those oyster bars and the predator fish are going to follow that bait. So, you know, those oyster bars that are on windblown shorelines that are close to those coves, things like that. That's where I'm getting a lot of my kind of top water blowups because I'm fishing those top waters around those oysters. So I'm not going to worry about getting snagged or anything like that. But as that sun comes up, I am having to change my presentations around generally, you know, when I'm fishing that water, that's, you know, only probably three feet deep, four feet deep. I'm generally using a lot of those owner twist locks, a lot of the weedless hooks that, you know, we show uh, often in our videos, just because it allows me to fish around that structure and not be too worried about it. Another great lure that I've been using, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to kind of play around with it, is uh, the new Salt Strong Power Prong that we've, uh, we've released. And we've got a junior version that comes with a weedless jig head bouncing that around those oysters or rocks, any kind of really hard structure that you know those crustaceans are kind of locked in on. If you're seeing a lot of shrimp popping around those oyster bars, just been a really, really effective lure to kind of bounce around those areas because it hits that shell, creates a lot of noise and attention in that zone. And those redfish absolutely slam it. Um, I don't know if you've kind of played around with any crustacean profiles recently, or if you're seeing certain profiles working around certain structure a little bit better? Is it just kind of all over the board for you? It's really all over the place. I mean, I've caught 
on my last trip, I caught a few redfish on paddle tails, and then I switched over to a shrimp profile like the uh, the power prawn and caught redfish on that and caught redfish on the jerk shad. I think it really comes down to the presentation more than the actual lure itself. Because like you said, throughout the day, you have to change, you know, the speed of the retrieve, either slow, fast, twitch and pause or a steady retrieve. So you really have to play around with that as opposed to switching out lures uh, all the time. And another thing about the uh, power prawn, this was uh, about a month or two ago, I got on a school of redfish. That's another thing with redfish. Sometimes you'll get on school of them. And if you're using a lure that gets torn up really easily, you're going to miss out on catching a lot of those fish because you might catch a fish lure gets torn up you have to replace the lure get another one out of the package but with the power prawn it's such a tough lure i think i caught 15 12 or 15 reds on just that one lure you know caught a red took it off the hook readjusted found the school again caught another fish so that's another nice thing about redfish usually if you find one or two you're going to find multiple in the area Oh yeah. Especially this time of year. It's a, it's like once you, once you found them and you kind of locked in that pattern, it's almost like, I feel like with trout, you can kind of pattern them in, know what type of spot they're at um, and really see what retrieve they want throughout, you know, the other times of the year, sometimes winter, summer, reds kind of spread out and they, some, some schools are doing their own thing. Sometimes they're not even schools, but this time of year, it seems like redfish are schooled up really hard and uh, you can really, really pattern them in. There was something really cool you just mentioned is uh, it's more about the action of the lure than the actual profile itself. I, a lot of times, have found myself fishing where there's really heavy concentrations of shrimp using those paddle tails, but kind of working them like a shrimp. So, uh, for example, our Slam Shady 2.0, you can pull the tail off that bad boy and work it kind of like a switch bait, and uh, you can catch some reds with it. But I've done the same thing with the Z-Mans, which you definitely can't pull those tails off with that Elastec, and just twitch, twitch, pause. And I, I've seen definitely increased strikes changing the presentation of you know that versus a constant retrieve and getting more hookups because it seems like the fish are dialed in on you know a darting action of a shrimp as you know not a swimming action of a mullet so it seems like i, I agree with you on that for sure the, the action of a bait definitely can play into getting more strikes you find that size right now is a really big factor for you as well i'm kind of sticking more in that three to four inch range do you, do you find that's kind of a similar size profile that you're using regardless of whether it's crustacean bait fish things like that for reds yeah i'm usually i mean all year long i stick to that three to four inch size but especially in the springtime or the end of winter you know waters are pretty clean right now and when you have really clean water those fish are going to be very spooky very finicky especially if they're getting highly pressured so if you go and throw you know like a five inch paddle tail at a redfish that's up on the shoreline you're probably going to spook that fish and most of the stuff they're eating right now isn't going to be, you know, a five, six inch mullet up shallow. You know, the finger mullet haven't really pushed in too much yet. I'm still seeing a lot of the bigger mullet uh, around, you know, what they call the hog legs. <laughs> and sometimes those reds are mixed in with them because those mullet are stirring up the bottom. So th those reds are taking advantage of those mullet spooking up food for them. So I, I really don't go any bigger than probably three, four inch baits. Uh, recently, I just caught a 40 inch red on a small little fiddler crab imitation. It was a chase baits, uh, crusty crab. It's like a two inch little crab looks like a fiddler crab and that thing inhaled it. <laughs> so smaller elephants eat peanuts, smaller baits are going to do the trick right now. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that 40 inch red was, was it tailing or how were you working that bait when it hit such a small presentation? Could you see it? Were you blind casting? How did that, I'd like to hear the story on that red real quick. So I was on a school of black drum. Usually when you find black drum too, you're going to find redfish in the area. I thought they were black drum. I just saw a black shadow. It was like four or five fish that were just swimming. So made a cast, let it sink to the bottom. I had some uh, scent on it, Procure at the time, and just let it sit there. And the fish got close enough, and I just slowly raised a rod tip to drag that crab along the bottom. Again, imitating what a crab would be doing. You don't want to pop a crab around. It's not what they do. As soon as I raised that rod tip, I actually have a video of it, and I'm going to put a video together soon. And that redfish went straight towards it and tailed on it, and it was game on. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. Yeah, I, I guess probably the question that's in a lot of people's minds right now listening to this is, is, well, what should I be throwing? We've talked about shrimp. We've talked about baitfish. We're talking about crabs now. 
if there's one lure that you could throw, I've got a pretty good idea of what it's going to be. There's one lure you could throw for reds right now in the springtime. What would it be, Tony? Uh, that's a tough one. If you asked me about a year or two ago, it would be a jerk shad, like a five inch watermelon colored jerk shad. That was my confidence go-to lure for ever with redfish. But now that I've gotten more into paddle tails, I would probably have to say a three to four inch paddle tail, just because you can cover more water. You can work it like a jerk shad, just more versatile. Yeah, no, I, I would have to agree there in terms of just if I could only have one, it'd probably be the paddle tail. But I, I've never, it's funny, I watched a lot of your videos. In fact, I, I just made a video this past week for you insiders who have access to it. It's that uh, the top five lures for spring fishing. I had some footage of Tony using those gulp jerk shads that uh, he's very well known for, caught a lot of fish on them. And, uh, you know, I've never been a huge fan of them because I've been fishing in the Carolinas for a while. We had that dirty water and that's kind of a sight lure. Uh, you need to have, you know, a little bit of clear water for those fish to be able to see that darting action. With paddle tails, you get a lot of vibrations, so you can fish in dirtier water. But I've been pleasantly surprised with how well those jerk shads work when you do have those scenarios where it's shallow, it's calm, it's clear, and uh, those fish can see that bait. I, I recently found myself, uh, for insiders, again, uh, another reason to join the Insider Club if you haven't already, I published a three-part series on redfish in the springtime, kind of dialing in on some of the different trends and fronts, things like that. And there was a prefrontal when I found these fish, kind of in open water, it was clear, it was a slightly windy-ish day, you know, a little bit, good little chop on the water that, that kind of disguised my profile uh, as I was drifting. I was seeing all these fish and they weren't hitting my top waters. They weren't hitting, you know, any kind of large presentations I was giving at them. That jerk shad that had that nice darting action was really good and subtle. I was using the Alabama leprechaun, just, you know, twitch, twitch, pause and letting it kind of settle down. Just like I watched you do, you have a great mini course on how you should retrieve jerk shads for redfish, trout, flounder, um, even snook, you know, I was getting hits almost every single cast of this thing. So I think it's also important. And I guess I w it was kind of begging the question there, asking you what your number one lure would be. But I also think it's important to, to judge it kind of based on what the water has got going on with it. If it's a little bit dirtier, you know, you're going to need that vibration. But we've seen you catch, you know, those 47 inch full redfish on three inch slam shady paddle tails. Uh, but that water seemed like it was a little bit dirtier than the areas you were catching the redfish, you know, that year or two prior with uh, the jerk shad. So it seems like a lot of it has to do with water clarity as well. Um, and that's kind of how I've been judging what I'm throwing is, you know, where is it in terms of whether I need something weedless, whether I need to throw top water on top of those oyster bars, is it, you know, dirty open water where I can better cover it with paddle tails, or is it a scenario where I've got fish that I can see in front of me that I should probably throw a jerk shad at to get a good subtle presentation, but something they can't deny if they can see that good darting action. Do you feel like that kind of, you know, different, factor scenario is playing into your lure selection as well or are you just kind of just sticking with paddle tail right now definitely i think um another big change that's happened recently is just the water conditions over in my area water is pretty dirty uh, most of the time now back when i was using the jerk shad i was sight casting like 99 percent of the time and a jerk shad is going to be much better to sight fish redfish because it's more of a finesse presentation it doesn't have the big kicking action like a paddle tail does usually if you throw a paddle tail in front of a fish in clean water probably going to spook that fish if you don't make the right cast and it's too close to them just because as soon as that tail starts going it's like whoa what was that and the redfish spooks off if you have something laying on the bottom not a lot of action you could just drag it uh, if it has a lot of scent on it like gulp that works really well i just i'd say 99.9% .9 of the fish that I sight casted to were on gulp jerk sads. I could cast that thing out and the fish would find it wouldn't even have to do anything. So water conditions definitely will play a role in what type of lure you should throw. Another thing with jerk shads with redfish, a lot of people make this mistake and it really comes down to patience. You know, people get impatient when they're using jerk shads because natural instinct, you want to cast it out. If you don't feel a bite, after a few bounces, people just want to reel it in and cast again. You got to work that thing all the way back to you. I ha I've had strikes five feet from the kayak after casting like 50 feet out. So you never know where those fish are going to be. And you just really have to slow it down with that type of lure. If you're using a paddle tail, it's much easier. You know, if you take somebody out new that's fishing for redfish, you just put a paddle tail on, say, 
here, cast this out, reel it in slowly. That's all you got to do. And if you're fishing in windy conditions, paddle tail is going to be much better because if you're trying to work a jerk shad really slow and patiently and it's windy out, it's just going to be a pain. So definitely those factors come into play. I 100% agree. So, so we just touched on wind really quickly, as you said, do you find that, you know, the way that the wind is blowing, I know you're fishing kind of the open bay systems of the mosquito lagoon, where you've got a lot of shallow water where the tide is almost dictated by that wind. It's going to move bait around. It's going to move the water levels around. How are you kind of using the wind to factor into where you're finding redfish? Cause I'll touch on my answer here after yours, but it's definitely a heavy factor into my game plan, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on how the wind is influencing where you're finding reds, how they're feeding, what they may be feeding on. Uh, what, what, do you, what are you using the wind for when you're getting your pre-trip plan together? So the wind over here in the Mosquito Lagoon area, Indian River, Banana River, where I mainly fish, that's going to determine what the water's doing, like you said, because there's really no tidal flow until you get like north, very north end of Mosquito Lagoon or very south Indian River by like Sebastian. So when I'm planning my trip, depending on the time of year, you know, in the springtime, I like a little bit of wind, but not too much. If anything, I'll still find wind protected areas. And I like to either have the wind at my back or have the wind, you know, going along the shoreline. And what I found with redfish, when you do have that wind, you know, blowing parallel to the shoreline, most of the time I'm finding fish cruising that shoreline going into the wind because that wind is going to be pushing water same way the current's doing. So those fish are going to be going into the wind. If there's any bait blowing down that shoreline with the wind, those redfish are going to be going right towards it. So very similar to what the current would be doing if it, you were fishing like in a tidal area. Uh, other than that, I'm mostly looking for wind protected areas, even in the summertime, you know, first thing in the morning, I'm still fishing wind protected spots because we get those, they call them sea breezes down here. Usually in the morning, the wind's pretty calm, and then it picks up from either the east or the west. And the lagoon, it faces north to south. So you got to pick which shoreline you're going to fish based on those winds. And you really don't want to be on the opposite side of the bay or the river when you have a strong wind coming across. It's just going to be a pain to fish, and there's not a lot of wind-protected spots to choose from uh, in the area that I'm at. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I've kind of started out using those wind protected shorelines. I find that, you know, it still is a little cold in the morning, still here kind of early to mid spring. Those fish still are kind of wanting to find that, you know, Goldilocks zone where it's kind of warm. It's got a little bit of chill to it. So I, I find that I still am fishing some slight wind protected areas, uh, but I completely agree with you on the fish kind of facing into the wind. Not only is it going to provide them, you know, looking for that tide, as you mentioned, that current, it's bringing bait to them as well. I find that, you know, fishing wind protected shorelines in the, or wind blown shorelines in the spring after, you know, the sun has risen, it's warmed up a little bit. Those fish are out actively hunting because that water's warmed up, their metabolism starts going. I find fishing those wind blown shorelines is really effective because that's where all the bait is getting displaced in your shallow flat areas. You know, maybe if you're fishing open bay systems where the water's a lot deeper. Um, you know, it could be a different story. I've not had a whole lot of experience fishing deep water redfish, but most of my flats fishing for reds or shallow bay fishing for reds, I'm focused right now on the wind blown areas just because a lot of shrimp and bait fish uh, here in Texas, we had that really bad freeze that eliminated a lot of bait. So fish are definitely prioritizing areas where they can have access to easy meals. Again, close to those deep zones in the morning um, where they can still have that kind of temperature thermocline refuge, but they are definitely moving shallow as it gets kind of later on into the day. And I, I found probably the best areas to focus on are those points where the, you know, because I do have a little bit more tidal flow here in the area that I'm fishing in Texas than you do in Mosquito Lagoon. I find that the areas where the tide and the wind happen to be opposing each other on a day, uh, on that specific day, you know, let's say you have an outgoing tide coming around a point, but you've got a nice south wind that's blowing up towards that point. And you've kind of got this little whirlpool that occurs where the tide is bringing bait out, but the wind is kind of still blowing in that, that point there and creating kind of a, a little eddy almost 
where there's a lot of bait that's locked into one little zone. And, you know, in addition to having all that bait there on that point, because of the tidal flow and the wind kind of pushing it right there, you've got all these fish that are in a spring transition already. So they're usually moving around points, points we've preached for a long time are a good place to look in the springtime, just because the migrations of fish from their winter holdings to their summer holdings, a lot of that takes place around points. It's just, for me, been a really, really effective area. You know, you combine that type of point with the current flow, the wind, with structure like oyster bars, close to deep channels. You've got yourself a slam spot right there, not just for redfish, but, you know, a lot of times you can find trout flounder there as well. I'm sure over in your area, that type of spot would also produce some snook, most likely. But it just seems like combining all the factors we've talked about today, you know, that's been my most productive area. Good stuff. Yeah, another thing, too, when you find redfish up shallow they're usually going to be cruising around you know they're not going to be just sitting in one spot just sitting there if they're up shallow they're most likely in feeding mode because they're looking for food up there if you find redfish deeper good good chances they're going to be sitting in a hole or they're going to be sitting right off the edge of a flat they're not really cruising around too much that i found when they're deeper have, have you seen anything like that yeah, I find redfish are, are just in touch on this in the last podcast we did. Redfish meander. That's what he called it. It's a great word to describe what they do in shallow water is meander around. When I find that they're in deep water, they're usually locked down. Like, uh, you know, I, I was fishing a lot of those deep holes in the Carolinas around this time last year. And uh, kind of those creek mouths, you know, on the outgoing tides, those, those fish get locked down in those deep holes. They don't move. They're very sedentary. Um, you know, they'll take meals that come by them, but they're not actively hunting around. When you're seeing fish that are in the shallows, you know, a little later on in the day, like you said, they're actively searching around for bait. That's usually when you're going to see redfish tailing. If you've actually not tried to fish a tailing school and just sat there and watched their behavior, they will move 25 yards in a very short, you know, period of time, just because the reason they're tailing is they're searching around through the mud. If they don't find something, they're moving on to the next little kind of hole where maybe a crab has dug itself into or a little pockmark where there might be some shrimp uh, that, that have kind of buried themselves in the mud. That's what those fish are doing. They're constantly moving around. So, you know, that's why I also, I preach this a lot is don't stay in one spot if you're not catching fish because those fish are actively moving around. If you're not seeing the activity, if you're not seeing the bait, you're not seeing the birds, you're not getting boils, those fish likely aren't there. They've moved to a different zone. A lot of people want to know, you know, the areas we're fishing. Obviously, we show them in our insider reports and people will go there and try to fish it, um, you know, and, and maybe they'll catch fish, maybe they won't. Those fish are constantly moving around. Those fish might be on one shoreline one day and they've, you know, tailed up the entire shoreline around a point and they're on the next shoreline the next day. So I agree with you. Those redfish are going to be always moving around. They're always going to give themselves away too, I find, this time of year when they're searching for bait, whether they're tailing, they're blowing up mullet, um, you know, Early in the morning, you'll hear them a lot of times before you see them. They're really, really loud. They're smacking bait on the top of the water. Um, but yeah, to go back to your question, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. But go back, going back to your question, redfish definitely meander around when it's you know shallow hunting scenarios. But if they're in deep water, they're locked down in those holes. They're not moving around a lot. If you're targeting creek mouse, things like that, you can know that you know those areas are going to be a little bit more consistent types of zones. Yeah. The only time I see them really just sitting still in the shallows is if you have a good amount of seagrass. I've seen them buried in the grass with just the tip of their tail sticking out. That's when you'll find them shallow, but I've never gotten them to eat when I see them doing that. I've been right next to them on the kayak, drop a lure right in front of them. They don't move. It's almost like they're sleeping. So if you see them moving around, they're most likely going to eat. Another thing, I don't know if you've seen this as well, but from what I've seen when I'm sight fishing redfish up shallow in clean water, if you notice a blue uh, color on their tail or even on their head, you see like a bluish kind of color, they seem to be more aggressive whenever I see that. And I usually get a strike. Have you, have you seen that? 100% agree with that. It's very funny. So I've done a lot of reading on that. The, the blue, the reason I find that they're more aggressive. Um, and I, again, you said that as well. So I agree with that statement. The reason that I think they're more aggressive is they're dialed in on darting actions of baits, faster moving baits, because they're chasing after shrimp. The blue that's in their tail, that's on their head, that comes from all the crustaceans that they're eating. Usually shrimp, a lot of times they'll get that hue from crabs as well. But again, we know that a redfish's diet is primarily on shrimp that are you know shallow like that. Most of the larger bulls do eat bait fish. 
But most of the fish, you know, that we're talking about in this episode uh, are the shallow juveniles. that are still feeding on shrimp um, and crustaceans, you know, that are moving really fast. So those darting actions, which is why our jerk shads work really well in those scenarios, they're dialed in on shrimp that are darting away from them. That's what keys them into eat. That's their reactionary strike. That's why we see them as aggressive. But the action that I think that they're, this is my theory. Again, there's no, not a whole lot of science behind it other than just what I've observed. And I'm sure what you've observed as well. But those redfish that have a lot of blue on their head or their tail, they've been eating a lot of crustaceans. That's kind of that indicative factor of that. Um, so the darting and the quick movement of your baits, I think, is what, you know, triggers those specific fish to eat. Not to say you're not going to get the same reaction out of a redfish that has, you know, your average tail tail, but there's a good chance that those ones that have really bright blue tails, you know, you'll find that they are more aggressive because they're dialed in on chasing down fast moving shrimp. They're more agile. They're kind of keen into it. So um, that's just my theory on it. I don't, I don't know uh, if you hold that same view, but that's just what I've seen. Yeah. Just whenever I see those, those fish that, you know, I can see their tail waving in the water and I see that blue hue on the end, toss the lure in front of, in front of them. And it's like, that fish is going to eat. And it does <laughs> just based on what I've seen. I'm sure a lot of people that are listening in or uh, watching this can, can relate. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's, we're going to get some comments on that one. I, I'd like to hear if anybody has experienced that same scenario comment below and let us know if, uh, if you see that redfish that have blue tails are more aggressive than those ones who don't. But, uh, I mean, I think that's a pretty good note to end on right there that, that blue tailed redfish are going to be your more aggressive uh, fish to target. But, uh, I think we've covered everything, you know, from lures, spot selection, wind, uh, is there anything that we missed out on Tony? I was just going to touch a little bit on the size of redfish. You know, a lot of people make a big misconception thinking you're only going to find small redfish up shallow. I've caught 40, 40 to 45 inch redfish in a foot and a half of water. So don't be surprised if you see a big redfish up shallow. You know, you're not always going to catch them deep. They could be up shallow too. Most of the slot size fish that I catch are in, you know, a foot, foot of water or even less. You know, up, up shallow cruising the shoreline with their back sticking out of the water, looking for food. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. Upper, I've, catch, I've caught a lot of upper slots in a foot or less. Uh, you know, and it's really fun because most times you can see them when they're that big, they're pushing weights uh, or they're tailing. Just they, they've got such a big presence. They're shallow. They're not scared of birds getting to them. So they're not afraid to make a lot of presence, a lot of noise. Um, unless it's, you know, in an area where there's a lot of human traffic, then most times you're not going to see them making that big of a, big of a ruckus with what they're doing. But if you're fishing areas that are far away from, you know, your average boat ramp or your average kayak trail, you'll find that those fish, you know, they don't care what's going on. They're going to be pushing wakes. They're going to be tailing. They're going to be aggressive. Uh, and you will know that they're there before you just blind cast at them. Again, not to say we've seen so many videos of Tony trolling, picking up some of these really big bulls. So it's definitely possible you get onto them that way as well. But uh, no, I totally agree. You can find a lot of really big fish in shallow water too. Yep. There's nothing for them out there that to really be afraid of aside from us. <laughs> you know, like you said, birds can't get them. If those fish are deep, you know, they got to worry about dolphins sharks whatever else may be swimming that's bigger than them that can get them in the deeper water yeah yeah well guys i think that uh that about covers it if you want to learn a little bit more in-depth information we've kind of touched on some of the different things that we do with the insider club you know our insider reports some of our private tip videos we do spot the sections kind of based on different species different redfish y'all's requests kind of breaking down different spots for members uh, the ways that we would fish them different tactics there's always great lessons in those spot a section. So if you've not checked those out, if you are an insider, highly recommend doing so. We put some really awesome lessons together in those spot a sections, but definitely check out our insider reports as well, where we give live on the water reports showing how we're fishing for these redfish. That spring kind of transition series that I just did was completely focused on reds, went through all the different fronts and everything that we've experienced here, how I was finding fish in different areas. It's a much more kind of comprehensive breakdown than just the topics that we've discussed in this video. We, we tried to keep it as general as we could so that we could kind of touch on a broad range of subjects, but for some more drilled down advanced information, highly recommend you join us in the Salt Strong Insider Club where we do amazing tips every week to help you guys get onto some more fish. And obviously we let you guys tell us what you want to see so that we can kind of create content that's going to help you guys become better fishermen. And all the lures that we talked about using in this video as well, we do have them in the Salt Strong shop. 
the Slam Shady, Alabama Leprechaun. I believe we've got some jerk shads on the way as well from Gulp. So definitely keep an eye out for those. But guys, thank you again so much for tuning in and we will see you guys on the next episode. Take it easy, y'all.